Following the proof of concept demonstrator X47A Pegasus, the X47B was born as a full-size technology demonstrating unmanned combat aerial vehicle UCAV intended for carrier operations within the ranks of the United States Navy. The X-47B holds roots in the DARPA-led JUCAS program, which was developed to find a single drone solution for both U.S. Army and Navy requirements. While the JUCAS program ultimately fell to the budget acts in February of 2006, the U.S. Navy persisted with the UCAV program all on their own through the X-47 initiative. Throughout the 2010s, the X-47 underwent several modifications and a subsequent series of special tests that not only proved the concept was feasible but demonstrated the machine's reliability. The expectations were sky high, and it was now time to prove if such an advanced technology could be readily exploited or if the mighty UAV was too progressive for its time. Boeing and Northrop Grumman were charged with its development. The USN eventually siding with Northrop Grumman, the X-47A was born as a smaller version, 19-foot wingspan of the full-sized X-47B to follow. The U.S. Navy did not commit to practical UCAS efforts until 2000, when it was awarded contracts of $2 million U.S. million each to Boeing and Northrop Grumman for a 15-month concept exploration program. Then, the Sea Service partnered with the Air Force, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman to come up with a single solution for both services. Design considerations for naval UCAV included dealing with heavy corrosive saltwater environment, deck handling for launch and recovery, command and control system interrogation, and operation in an aircraft carrier's high electromagnetic interference environment. The Navy's interests included deploying a UCAV for reconnaissance missions as a means to penetrate into protected enemy airspace and identify targets for upcoming raids. Hence, in early 2001, the service awarded a contract to Northrop Grumman to develop an unmanned combat air system demonstrator that would be known as the X-47 Pegasus. The resulting demonstrator turned out to be a simple black arrowhead without a vertical tailplane. It had a leading edge sweep of 55 degrees and a trailing edge of 35 degrees, and six control surfaces with two elebombs and a small flap structure. Plus, it was powered by a single prep Whitney Canada JT15D 5C small high bypass turbofan engine. To provide realistic testing, the demonstrator was built to be the same size and weight as the projected operational craft, with a full-size weapons bay capable of carrying existing missiles. The JUCAS program was terminated in February 2006, following the Quadrennial Defense Review. The U.S. Air Force and Navy proceeded with their own UAV programs. The Navy selected Northrop Grumman's X-47B as its unmanned combat air system demonstrator program. Following the proof-of-concept demonstration, a full-size technology demonstrating UCAV was born. It had the exact same size and weight as the projected operational aircraft to carry out more realistic tests, and the X-47B would also have a complete weapons bay to carry existing missiles. The Sea Service went through with the undertaking as a part of the X-47 initiative, which took almost an entire decade. The X-47B prototype rolled out from Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale, California on the 16th of December 2008. Its first flight was planned for November 2009, but the project fell behind schedule. On the 29th of December 2009, Northrop Grumman oversaw taxi tests of the aircraft at the Palmdale facility, with it taxiing under its own power for the first time in January 2010. A year later, the aircraft underwent active towed taxiing tests but did not actually try taxiing under its own power until early in 2010. The first flight of the X-47B demonstrator, designated Air Vehicle 1, took place at Edwards Air Force Base, California on the 4th of February 2011. It first flew in cruise configuration with its landing gear retracted on the 30th of September 2011. A second X-47B demonstrator, designated AV-2, conducted its maiden flight at Edwards Air Force Base on the 22nd of November 2011. The two X-47Bs were initially planned to have a heavy three-year test program with 50 tests at Edwards AFD and NAS Patuxent River, Maryland, culminating in sea trials in 2013. However, they performed so consistently that preliminary tests ended after 16 flights. The Navy decided to have them demonstrate carrier launches and recoveries, as well as autonomous in-flight refueling with a probe and drogue. In November 2011, the Navy announced that aerial refueling equipment and software would be added to one X-47B in 2014 for testing. They also affirmed that the demonstrators would never be armed.
In 2012, Northrop Grumman tested a wearable remote control system designed to allow ground crews to manually steer the X-47B along the carrier deck. The tailless X-47B was given a wingspan of 62 feet, making it nearly twice as wide as it is long and 17 feet wider than the Navy's Boeing F-A-18 Super Hornet Strike Fighter. The X-47B features a maximum speed of the high subsonic range with an unresealed range of 6 hours, over 2,100 nautical miles. In May of 2012, AV-1 began high-intensity electromagnetic interference testing at Patuxent River to test its compatibility with electronic warfare systems. Aircraft carriers represent perhaps the most complex electromagnetic spaces on any surface ship whenever their multiple radars and systems are switched on. The X-47B initiated its career-based evaluation aboard the USS Harry S. Truman in November, and in less than a month, the prototype successfully completed the first at sea test phase. Fortunately, the aircraft proved to be compatible with the carrier's flight deck, anger bays, and communication systems. The X-47B was lifted dockside by the crane aboard the USS Harry S. Truman at the Naval Station Norfolk, Virginia, to begin its career-based assessment in December of 2012. The aircraft required compatibility testing with communication systems, movement from hangar bay to the flight deck, and all related aircraft type duties while on a carrier. The tests indicated that the X 47B was well matched for carrier functions, as good as any manned aircraft currently in use. Over the last decade, the USN has spent upwards of $1.8 billion on two X 47B prototypes. Though the day will surely come when these drones will replace the piloted aircraft as we know it. For some observers, a blessing to accept, and, for others, a philosophical question of whether it should be allowed to happen at all. The X-47B has met some recent notable program goals. On May 14, 2013, the system became the first drone aircraft to be successfully catapulted from the deck of an aircraft carrier USS George H.W. Bush on the Atlantic Ocean. Soon after the launch, the X-47B UAV was transferred over to a second pilot who electrically flew her across the Chesapeake Bay to the drone's base and landed her on a simulated carrier deck. Weeks earlier, on May the 4th, it completed a simulated carrier landing with a rester hook on the Patuxent River. On May 17, 2013, the X-47B took off from its Patuxent River base and made a number of approaches to the USS George H.W. Bush, successfully completing a number of touch-and-go landings and takeoffs. The touch-and-go process is standard U.S. Navy Airmen training on all carriers. However, the model had a technical issue during the third try and was diverted to the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. As one of its three navigational subsystems failed, the remaining two identified the problem and alerted the operator, who followed the protocols to abort the landing attempt. The mishap ended up proving the drone's reliability and autonomy. Design of the X-47B includes a very defined triangular shape, which appears to be growing in popularity with drone engineers over the world. There are no obvious vertical surfaces about the aircraft making it a true flying wing design in the mold of Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit. As for its power plant, a single Pratt & Whitney F-100-220U turbofan engine was buried in the fuselage, and it aspirated through a shallow duct along the forward spine, while the exhaust went through a specially designed port at the rear. Evidently, the lack of a pilot housed in a typical canopy left room for significant internal volume, which could be taken advantage of when carrying specialized mission equipment, armament, fuel stores, or additional avionics and subsystems. Production units would be fielded with two internal weapons bays, just like the Lockheed F-22 and F-35 fighters. Its capacity amounted to 4,500 pounds of ordnance, with guided munitions being its most likely load. Furthermore, its carrier-based capabilities demanded key qualities integrated into its design, namely the folding of its wings for easier storage, a reinforced undercarriage with an arrestor hook, and corrosion resistance to counter the effects of hostile environments. The X-47B's undercarriage was retractable and considered of the two single-wheeled main legs and a thin-wheeled nose leg. The drone's flight system is autonomous, and its navigation is handled by a hybrid vision-based global positioning system. Meanwhile, its flight path is pre-programmed while it operates under the supervision of a mission operator. The device can reach a cruising speed of 685 miles an hour or a high subsonic speed of approximately 0.45 Mach with an operational range in excess of 2,100 nautical miles. The aircraft is cleared to operate its service ceilings nearing 40,000 feet.
Overall dimensions include a wingspan of 62 feet with a running length of 38 feet on the ground, height, and a height of 10.4 feet. The folding wings allow the span to contract to 30.9 feet when folded. The drone was also fitted with electro-optics, infrared, synthetic aperture radar, inverse SAR, ground moving target indicator, electronic support measures, and maritime moving target indicator sensors, while its airframe and internal systems eventually incorporated stealth characteristics. The project was initially funded under a $635.8 million contract awarded by the Navy in 2007. By January 2012, the X-47B's total program cost had grown to an estimated $813 million. Government funding for the X-47B UCAS D program was to run out at the end of September 2013, with the close of the fiscal year. However, in June 2014, the Navy provided additional $63 million for the post-demonstration development of the X-47B. By the spring of 2015, the fighter-sized drone successfully completed the first ever autonomous aerial refueling demonstration, and shortly after, the primary test program was finished. Still, roughly a year later, the Navy decided to convert the previously surveillance and strike-capable aircraft into a reconnaissance and aerial refueling UAV with limited strike capability. The subsequent unmanned carrier-launched airborne surveillance and strike project was cut off in favor of the MQ-25 Stingray Carrier-Based Aerial Refueling System, or CBARS. For all its success, the X-47B eventually raised concerns about its costs and proved insufficiently stealthy for the project's needs. There was an initiative to convert the demonstrators into museum exhibits, but the prototypes remained in active flying condition instead, allowing the subsequent evaluations and variants. On October 25, 2017, the company announced its withdrawal from the MQ-25 competition, saying it would be unable to operate under the terms of the services requested for proposals. A modified deck handling system and demonstration was planned, but efforts were suspended. One X-47B performed a required upkeep static engine run in spring of 2019. The others remained stored in a hangar. The older X-47A Pegasus air vehicle was also kept in a covered open-air hangar at Palmdale. The general public cannot enter the Palmdale facility. Still, the technology and expertise gained from the remarkably successful venture earned much recognition and awards like the 57th Annual Laureate Award for Extraordinary Achievements in Aeronautics and Propulsion hosted by Aviation Week, and the 2013 Collier Trophy for Excellence in Aeronautic Technology and the National Aeronautic Association. To that end, these aircraft had built a resume that you would be proud of. Thus, there's a decent chance that you'll be seeing these X-47Bs in either two of the aviation museums really soon. Hello, I'm Brian Humphreys, Director of Communications for Autonomous Systems and Advanced Programs at Northrop Grumman. Recent times have seen some amazing advances in autonomous systems, from self-driving cars on our highways to unmanned planes the size of 757s monitoring our oceans. These individual systems are changing our lives. Imagine then the advances when autonomous systems begin to collaborate with each other and with their commanders. Today, I'm with Richard Sullivan, Vice President, Advanced Programs at Northrop Grumman. Thank you, Richard. We're going to discuss advances in autonomy and in particular how systems and people will work together. Where do you think the next advances in autonomy will be coming from? Great question. When you think about where we are today with autonomous vehicles on the road, with uh, the automatic cruise control for one, and when you look at where the airplanes have gotten with their autopilots, those are really, I'll say, the first step of autonomy. And as we look at where we're going forward with how much you can, I'll say, rely more on the computer systems within the vehicles to take the systematic steps that are, I'll say, the routine steps and have the uh, computers and the autonomy take those things over, you can see that blossoming through all levels of technology all across the environment, whether it's in airplanes, whether it's in spacecraft, whether it's in 
ground vehicles, whether it's in undersea vehicles, it's going to be exploding through all of those domains. You mentioned advanced autonomous aircraft. Northrop Grumman was responsible for, or is responsible for, one of the arguably um, the most advanced unmanned aerial system in the world today, the X-47B. Can you tell me what's so speci special about the X-47? You know, we love to talk about the X-47B. It won the Collier Trophy in 2013. It was on sea trials from 2012 to 2015. Uh, world's first autonomous aircraft to do carrier takeoffs and landings. In 2015, the world's first fully autonomous aerial refueling. When you look at the technology that was developed in the early 2010s and how much we've continued to invest and advance that autonomy, what we see going forward is just gonna blow everybody's mind away. What are some of the challenges when it comes to getting a, an unmanned aircraft to land on an aircraft carrier? Well, first of all, it's about trusting the, the, the software and trusting the algorithms. One of the things that we have with our modern digital engineering and the Agile Enterprise is use modeling and simulation to test hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands of trials, adjusting each of the parameters that, that the aircraft may see and understand under all the conditions through an actual operation, we understand and trust where the, what the vehicle is gonna do. The X-47B had to operate on a aircraft carrier alongside manned aircraft. What were some of the challenges that you had to address in, in having that unmanned system operate on a day-to-day -day basis with manned aircraft? You know, a, a big part of it was the fact that there wasn't a human in the loop, right? A human in the loop. What we had was a human on the loop. When you look at the operations on the aircraft carriers, what we had to make sure is that we had responsive control of the X-47B. In other words, there's a human on the loop, not a human in the loop. In other words, you know, the pilot's sitting uh, within the computer itself, but the operator, the commander, knew what the airplane was gonna be doing. So there was tight operations for takeoffs uh, alongside an F-18 landing where they had to pull the X-47B off before an F-18 landed. That all was tightly orchestrated with, the, with both the the Northrop Grumman employees as well as the, the great collaboration with the US Navy. The X-47B also proved the ability to refuel air-to-air -air behind a manned tanker. Can you tell me what's so significant about that achievement? Very specifically to the tanker, it's really the, one of the first things when you talk about manned unmanned teaming, which I think is really, really uh, interesting and a lot of things that we're talking about today. The ability for the X-47B to approach and connect with the tanker showed how the trusted autonomy was uh, validated and, and implemented in a real world scenario. You talked about manned, unmanned teaming. While you were working on the X-47B, you were also looking at another type of teaming, teaming of unmanned systems with a program called DARK. Can you, A, explain what the acronym stands for and why it's so special? Right, so DARK is our technology that we call distributed autonomy and responsive control. What distributed autonomy means is how we can implement autonomy within the vehicles themselves, as well as within the mission management station. Responsive control is about making sure that operators have the ability to understand what the vehicles are going to be doing with their autonomy and be able to take over if they need to. So what are some of the benefits of distributed autonomy? The benefits of distributed autonomy is that you're able to have fewer operators managing a larger number of resources. And the best part is you can have a heterogeneous type of vehicle. So you can have different types of vehicles with different types of sensors operating with a small crew, a small human operator set that's able to manage the objective. The mission objective is what they're looking to accomplish, not what is the next point on the, on the blue line they're going to be flying to. Perhaps you can give us a scenario where responsive control um, demonstrates its value or, or, or a scenario that demonstrates the value of responsive control. A good example of the value of responsive control is if you have a, 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 mi a, a mission space that you're trying to accomplish and um, the, you, you may set certain constraints within the system to say, you know, if I get this low on gas, I'm going to have my aircraft, you know, come back home so that they can uh, hit the tanker or, or they can go all the way back to base. 
But in certain scenarios, you may want to extend the operational footprint. You may be willing to push into those margins. So the operator can take over that scenario and say, hey, I'm going to push into the margins a little bit here because what's going on in other aspects of the, of the mission still need to have resources that are staring at them. So what are some of the types of missions that DARK could be used for? The types of missions that we would see DARK being used for is one, I'll say the more boring missions where let's say you're looking across a vast ocean, looking across a vast desert, just watching uh, uh, any potential ingress or egress of an area that you're doing overwatch on that's 24 by 7, 365 with sensors that are just looking for anything to happen. Uh, that's one example. And the other side of the example would be where the missions could be extremely dangerous and you can use multiple assets that are going to be adjusting and adapting to how the environment is changing. So just so just to be clear, when you're talking about, let's let's look at that ocean scenario for a moment. So you're talking about how many uh, unmanned systems operating in an, in an environment? So how many oper any systems can DART control and, and how would they share workload? It's a scalable system, so there isn't really any limit. It's a limit of the computers and the processing that you'll have in your building type of a thing. Um, how they share the workload, it really then goes on to what the sensor footprints are. So if you're using wide area surveillance radars looking at you know, the north coast of, a, of, a, of an island, you know, you can be just watching the sea for any types of incoming ships that may be useful in different scenarios. And the, how you cover that is going to depend, is going to then drive how many vehicles you need to cover that, you know, 24 by seven, is it, you know, certain, you know, certain things that get triggered, tripwires that get triggered that determine when you have to go or what you need to look for. So it's all user definable. Maybe you can give us another example of uh, a real world example of how dark would you be utilized. Something that keeps me up at night working in this industry now for a little over 25 years is how can we use a system to help scenarios, really bad scenarios like a downed pilot scenario. And we see the environment with the threat levels going up and how the threats are dynamic. That's really where something like dark will really be beneficial, where we have multiple vehicles that are, that are in, in, in the area of regard, some of them with different types of sensors. How can we find the pilot? Where was the last known information? And how can we use all that information to optimize the different vehicles to look for this down pilot? And when we think about that is, each of the vehicles may have already been on a mission. They have different levels of fuel. They can't go and engage. Uh, we have different scenarios where they're still uh, keeping an eye on other parts of the of the battle space, so they can't get engaged. And and when we ask a human operator in the loop to make all these decisions with everything going on simultaneously with his buddy somewhere down in the field, right? Let's let the operations that the computers can do best, which is solve really complex math problems really quickly and let the human operator take advantage of the things that they do best, which is manage a scenario and find other ways to bring assets in to, to support it. Because as soon as something like a dark system finds it, we're going to have to go and send in helicopters, send in rescue, send in A-10s, whatever they need to have to protect and save our warfighters. So in the dark scenario, if one of your unmanned systems that perhaps the one that's taken the task to go and get that downed pilot, if it loses uh, communications or it gets into a storm, what happens with dark? So it happens with dark in a scenario where you have a comms challenge or a weather challenge is the scenario, the, the scenario adjusts, right? So it, the objectives of the mission still exist, but the constraints of how you perform the mission have changed. And that's the greatest thing is when you have these dynamic scenarios or changing scenarios, Dark will continuously adjust to those scenarios. So another air vehicle will take over that task automatically? Yes, that, that's correct. So the, 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 the task allocation then gets assigned to another vehicle that is best suited to take over that mission. Digital transformation is changing the environment for everyone, both the commercial environment, the civil environment, and the military environment. It's 
creating some significant challenges for the commanders. So can you talk a little bit about how DARK helps address those challenges? Right, so the digital transformation is, it, it happens on both sides. So the complexity of the threats that we're going after is making the commander's job significantly more complex as well. And what we see is how autonomy is gonna help, I'll say provide force multiplication to the commander in terms of understanding that certain decisions that the aircraft are making are, are being made because it's the best decision considering the inputs that it has. So it really becomes a force multiplier for whether it's a, a mission commander and a military application, it could be a commercial application, it could be uh, you know, a, a, a science application. How can we leverage autonomy to take advantage of the exponential amount of inputs that we're seeing from the environment, the sensors, the aircraft, the threats, all across the, the spectrum? The challenge is though, that in the digital space, threats are infinite and they're only becoming more numerous. So that's where dark comes into play. Yeah, dark comes into play when you have more things than a human can accomplish in terms of trying to satisfy these tasks in this increasingly complex environment.